Hello guys, welcome back. It's me, your favorite booktuber, and today I'm gonna do my November wrap up. Basically, I was a bad reader in the months of September and October. I only finished one book. I was doing some traveling, I didn't feel like reading, whatever, whatever. I'm kicking myself in the pants because the average, not the average, but the mode of uh, reading, if you would, is that most months this year I read about 10 books and had I been consistent with that I would have read about 96 doing some quick math there I would have read 96 books by now had I you know stayed consistent but I didn't I dropped the ball and it is what it is regardless November I came back with a bang and I read 11 books and now we're going to talk about those. We're going to do a little deep dive, if you would. November also happened to be NaNoWriMo, which I didn't do. <laughs> and it was nonfiction November, which I did do. The first book that I read, I did it on audio. It was Square Haunting. This is a group biography that explores the lives of five women who all lived within that, like, Bloomsbury area. So we have the poet HD, the detective novelist Dorothy L. Sayers, uh, Jane Harrison, Eileen Power, and Virginia Woolf. Now, each woman gets her own chapter, and we kind of see their early life through that moment when they're living in the Bloomsbury area, and then also what happens to them afterwards. Interlaced through all of them, Virginia Woolf is kind of, her name comes up a lot, and it makes sense why we end with her. This was really moving, and I wasn't expecting it to be, through the author's research, we really come to understand so many things. One, how the wars affected these women. And obviously, that sounds kind of wild to say, but it did really hit me how much the war must have, how much the war weighed on individuals' psyches and their creative expression and the correlation between whether or not they were creating or what they were creating and how just the events of the times were affecting them. We also deep dive into these women's relationships, their relationships with other women, their relationships with men, and we see how all of these women have to grapple with a kind of war between society's expectations of what they should be and what they should do and their own creative uh, fuel. So they're all devoting themselves to their art, but throughout their life, they are kind of having to toe this line between artists versus women. And they also have to grapple with presenting themselves, who they are publicly versus privately, and how they explore their femininity through those different uh, spaces. And I really liked reading this then I also read Oh to Be a Painter by Virginia Woolf, which is really slim, super easy reading. It's a compilation of essays on art, a lot of paintings, painters, and she's really coming back to this theme of different modes of creation and how writers are jealous of painters, which I thought was a lot of fun to read. Another book that I read was Why We Should All Read Kafka. Sorry, that's not the title. Why You Should Read Kafka Before You Waste Your Life by James Hawes. By James Hawes. And this book is very conversational in its tone. And it's kind of like an extended essay. Our author is debunking a lot of the myths around Kafka, that he was a tortured artist, that he was impoverished, that his family hated him, that he was prude and didn't, you know, whatever. And through his research, he debunks all of these major myths around Kafka. Kafka had a very loving, loving family that enabled him to basically do whatever he wanted. He spent a lot of time in the brothels. He was a man about town and he was enjoying his life. He also kind of traces the root of Kafka's creative genius, if you would, and it's kind of like, it makes sense where Kafka drew came up with some of these ideas and where he drew his inspiration from. And that was really interesting. I think 
it was a good read, but you have to keep in mind that this is very conversational. It's really, really conversational. Reunion by Fred Ullman. This is also very brief. Uh, this is kind of the male equivalent of Sweet Days of Discipline in the regards that it's an exploration of a school time friendship and how all consuming that is. This tells the story of a Jewish boy who is friends with um, this very like German aristocracy son guy. And through their friendship, they do really care for each other, but then World War II is encroaching on their friendship and you see kind of the character's loss of innocence but it's very it's a very contained story. I think it was really enjoyable. It's not. It's like really moving. Okay, then I read The Sluts by Dennis Cooper. This was a buddy read with um, Nathan from Nathan Snook. I'm thinking of his Instagram handle, which isn't that. Um, so this was a wild book. This was a really good internet book. This uses the format of a forum to reveal the story of an escort and his lover pimp guy. So as you're reading the novel, as you move across these reviews, there's this like fervor, this excitement, this anticipation, this energy, because more and more people want a piece of the action. They either want to fuck the main players or enact violence on them, or they want to get to the bottom of the truth. But through these reviews, truth is very not truthful. You're constantly asking yourself, what is truth? What is really happening here? There's a lot of violence as well, but I do think that this idea of fame, internet culture, niche communities, perfect internet novel. And I think you can see so much truth to our internet culture of this day and age. My only complaint is I think we could have caught maybe like 20 pages just because it is so intense that sometimes you need a break. It definitely did make me want to read more of Dennis Cooper's work. I was absolutely floored with this piece. Then on audio, I also did like, comment, subscribe by Mark Bergen, which is all about YouTube. Basically, our author kind of is an expert on Google and he goes way back in time to the foundation of YouTube, the three founders, what they were aiming to do, what was their kind of inspiration, and then how the founders leave, uh, Google buys them, how YouTube is kind of in a no man's land almost with Google where uh, people who work at Google don't really want to spend time at YouTube. YouTube doesn't fit into their the overall like Google culture, whatever you're exploring. Or he's exploring that um, tenuous relationship between the two. And then he goes to when Susan Wojcicki becomes the CEO of YouTube and it's really fascinating. And I think especially as people who spend a lot of time on YouTube and or now make YouTube videos is definitely something that everyone should read. It's kind of the first of its kind, I would say, and there's so much interesting things and conversations to be had about YouTube and the power it wields within our internet platforms and how YouTube, the, the basically you come away from reading this and you realize that YouTube almost doesn't have an identity. And maybe that's part of the reason why it has lasted as long as, it, as, it, as it's had. There was a time when, it's really hard to talk about because there's a lot happening in the different case studies that he looks at. He looks at how YouTube's algorithm exists, how they try to maintain like a very hands-off approach, but at the same time, because the model of YouTube is based off of um, the revenue model, if you would, because it took a long time for them to get, get any revenue, is an advertiser one. So they have to really pander to certain, you know, expectations from their advertisers. It's really hard for me to talk about this book. I took a lot of notes because I was really fascinated by it. I definitely re recommend reading it if you watch a lot of YouTube, make YouTube videos, whatever it may be, definitely check it out. 
there was a lot of takeaways. YouTube's relationship with creators, YouTube's relationship with advertising revenue, um, YouTube and censorship. Also, kind of the main takeaway is that YouTube, just the volume, the sheer volume of videos and things that are being uploaded on here has made it such that YouTube is a repository of the human experience almost. I also read Nothing But The Night by John Williams. This is also another slim guy. Uh, this is John Williams' debut novel and it tells the story of a young man who experienced a traumatic event in his childhood and how he is still mired in that pain. In his 20s, he's unable to really do anything with his life because he is still weighed down by this. If you wanted to, you could say that this is the male equivalent of Animal by Lisa Tadio, if you wanted to. I think there's some really great sentences. It feels very modern and fresh, and I liked it. That's really all I have to say about that. The quote that I guess I really liked was on page 63. There's nothing worse than being alone when you aren't strong enough to face your own thoughts. Now let's talk about Brother Alive by Zayn Khalid, which I started in October and I think this was the reason why my reading was struggling. This is a very ambitious novel and it's hard to talk about because there's so much going on. There are three boys, Yosef and two others. Yusuf is Middle Eastern, one is Korean, one is Black, and all three were adopted by Salim, who knew their parents, and he's a very hands-off father. They all grow up in Staten Island. They're really well-educated well because Salim is, like, hella smart, and he makes them read all these things and study all these things, and... They grow up, but they don't have a lot of affection from Salim. Now, mind you, one of the boys, our protagonist, he also has like a double, a shadow, if you would. And the shadow feeds off of him and Yusuf will feed him his memories and the shadow grows. So that's the story. Also, did I mention that this is told in letters? I didn't really like that. So part one is an exploration of their childhood up until they go to college, basically, or a little bit after that. Part two is the letter they receive from their adopted father, basically explaining his absence and talking about who their parents were. Part three, the boys decide that they're gonna go find the father because the father went to the Middle East where he had become friends with the boys' fathers and there was this weird like utopian city being built on the ideas of prospering the Islamic civilization and you know bringing glory back to them but not through like fundamentalism per se but rather education indoctrination and so they go back to the city but before they can do that they have to like turn themselves into fundamentalists that's like a weird little segue where Yusuf is then like writing on forums and whatever so then somehow that happens and we spend like 20 pages discussing how they go from Staten Island to the Middle East and it's, it gets really like bogged down in the details where the driver picked us up and we knew not to speak to him and blah blah blah. So essentially they get to the Middle East and they're all three of these characters are kind of getting accustomed to the lay of the land. Some of them like it, some of them don't. They're making hella money and then tension starts to rise because obviously we need tension. This is a novel. There must be a plot and characters from the part two come into it. There's a lot happening. Then part four is the culmination, tying up loose ends. That's the story. Um, part one, there's some nice writing, but as a novel, I think there was either two ways we could have gone about this. First would have been to cut a lot of things, to call a lot of part one and cut like half the characters. So rather than having three brothers, there would have been two. Rather than having the two children that feature prominently, there only would have been one. Adolfina, that character, would have cut her completely. Like we could have done that. And then on part three, which is where actually I would say the action of the novel is, 
we could have then fleshed that out further because sometimes it felt like things would move along really quick. The, the pacing was a bit off there in all of this. That's one way we could have gone about it. Or I think had we wanted to keep all the characters, we could have added another 150, 200 words, sorry, <laughs> another 150, 200 pages and actually flushed this out because I do think that could have been another way to handle this. You either cut more or you add more and flush things out further. That's what I think about this novel. I, um, another book that I did on audio, this is a big audio heavy month, was The Secret Life of Groceries. Now this was fascinating. The Secret Life of Groceries in America, mind you. Our author starts us off with a very visceral scene. Now, if you have lived in New York, in Manhattan downtown, you know the Whole Foods on Bowery. Our author describes the scene of the workers having to clean the fish tank and the filth that somehow envelops it. And it's so, yeah. But basically that's kind of how the whole entire no uh, book will make you feel. He dives deep into grocery stores in America talking about Trader Joe's. So if you ever wondered who Joe is, you find out here. This man was brilliant, very, very smart. He brought a lot of innovation to groceries and particular Trader Joe's. He was able to predict a lot of our consumer habits, basically creating the company and their offerings to pandering to the overeducated, underpaid, and building out the ecosystem that is Trader Joe's. And then it gets to the turning point where he then sells it to the Aldi brothers. That's part one. We have a deep dive into trucking and their role in our grocery system, Based on, not even just groceries, everything. Our author really stressed how every single thing that you use has been touched by trucking. It is all shipped there. Even if you think that you are very self-sufficient, you're gonna build your own house, like the wood that comes through, unless you're cutting the wood yourself, whatever supplies you're gonna be using to build your house, most likely have tra traveled through trucks. And he really deep, dives deep into the process of educating truckers. He talks about the system of trucking, how a lot of people kind of become indentured into the trucking system. I thought it was really fascinating. Then we do a chapter on how to kind of create your own business. Like if you have your own brand of salsa or whatever, there's that. If you don't know if the food industry is really tough in whatever capacity, like most restaurants don't make it past seven years. And this is also another harrowing story about how it's really hard to make your own food line but it's probably the least interesting for me then we do a deep dive into the fishing industry maybe other people might know a lot more about i didn't know anything about which was really shocking because i eat a lot of seafood and then we also talk about one more thing oh our our narrator also did a little stint in Whole Foods where he's learning about hospitality. I think those are most of the heavy hitters, but it was really interesting. And I think if you are American, you might want to check it out. You might find it to be equally enthralling. Then things change gears because I read Always in December by Emily Stone. After Thanksgiving, I read this. I was hoping for a romance, holiday, Christmas vibes. And if you're going to be writing within the genre, you have, you should, please, uh, fit the very basic tenets. The promise that you make to the reader is that this will have a happy ending. Spoiler, this does not have a happy ending. And days after reading this, I was walking the streets and I was like, I can't believe I did this. I like wish I didn't read this because I wanted a happy ending and I did not get this. What this story is about, we have our main character, this girl whose parents um, passed when she was nine years old during Christmas, on Christmas day. So Christmas is always like a very tough time for her. And she has this tradition where she'll write a letter to her parents and then mail it. So she's about to go do that and when she does like on route to dropping off the letter, she runs into this guy with her bike 
and she feels so bad that she's like, oh, let me buy you a drink. They do that and he's basically kind of a grumpy guy and they end up spending Christmas together and then he disappears on her and then they like subsequently keep on running into each other and then the ending happens and yeah, that's the book for you. If you want a happy ending, don't read it. If you like romance and you're okay with there not being a happy ending, like I just wish I had known what I was getting into with this. That's all. So that's why I'm really stressing the vibes there. Then I also read The Walk by Robert by Robert Walter. I've been doing a lot of walking lately, guys. Like, you know, minimum 10K steps a day. And this is really fun. It's a uh, meditation on walking and the different vibes and scenes that you encounter. So our narrator is a walker and a writer and he's strutting down his little city, village, town, I don't know where he's living. And he's wearing a yellow suit and he's talking about what he's seeing. He has some errands to run. He goes to the tailor. He gets mad at the tailor because the tailor's messed up a suit. But then he's like, you know what? It's fine. I'm gonna go to the accountant. So then he goes to the accountants and he tells them, you know, tax season is upon us. Please, you know, I'm just a poorly writer. Don't tax me a lot. And the accountant's like, but we always see you walking. And he's like, yeah, because I'm a writer, I need to walk. I need to see what's happening. This is the only excursion that I allow myself. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to read. There's lots of just thoughts on life, but it's not upsetting per se. You know, it's like, it's good vibes. Okay, that's my November wrap up. Please let me know if you've read any of these books, what your thoughts were. I know uh, nonfiction November, so tell me if you part partook, what you read, what you liked. Did you do NaNoWriMo? Did you finish? Tell me everything and I will see you guys hopefully soon with a new video.